Disc 26, Thief of Time By Terry Pratchett Audiobook 2x19 Have you read this? Lady L.E. Jean waved a hand at one and at one of the trolls, who lumbered over and dropped an oblong package on the counter. Jeremy undid it. It contained a small book. Grim fairy tales, he said. Read the story about the glass clock of bad shoeshine, said Lady L.E. Jean. Children's stories, said Jeremy. What can they tell me? Who knows? We will call again tomorrow, said Lady L.E. Jean, to hear about your plans. In the meantime, here is a little token of our good faith. The troll laid a large leather bag on the counter. It clinked with the heavy, rich clink of gold. Jeremy didn't pay it a great deal of attention. He had quite a lot of gold. Even skilled clockmakers came to buy his clocks. Gold was useful because it gave him the time to work on more clocks. These earned him more gold. Gold was, more or less, something that occupied the space between clocks. I can also obtain invar for you, in large quantities, she said. That will be part of your payment, although I agree that even invar will not serve your purpose. Mr. Jeremy, both you and I know that your payment for making the first truly accurate clock will be the opportunity to make the first truly accurate clock, yes. He smiled nervously. It would be wonderful, if it could be done, he said. Really, it would be the end of clock making. Yes, said Lady L.E. Jean. No one would ever have to make a clock again. Tick this desk is neat. There is a pile of books on it, and a ruler. There is also, at the moment, a clock made out of cardboard. Miss picked it up. The other teachers in the school were known as Stephanie and Joan and so on, but to her class she was very strictly Miss Susan. Strict, in fact, was a word that seemed to cover everything about Miss Susan and, in the classroom, she insisted on the miss in the same way that a king insists upon your majesty, and for pretty much the same reason. Miss Susan wore black, which the headmistress disapproved of but could do nothing about because black was, well, a respectable color. She was young, but with an indefinable air of age about her. She wore her hair, which was blonde white with one black streak, in a tight bun. The headmistress disapproved of that, too. It suggested an archaic image of teaching, she said, with the assurance of someone who could pronounce a capital letter. But she didn't ever dare disapprove of the way Miss Susan moved, because Miss Susan moved like a tiger. It was in fact always very hard to disapprove of Miss Susan in her presence, because if you did she gave you a look. It was not in any way a threatening look. It was cool and calm. You just didn't want to see it again. The look worked in the classroom, too. Take homework, another archaic practice the headmistress was ineffectually against. No dog ever ate the homework of one of Miss Susan's students, because there was something about Miss Susan that went home with them, instead the dog brought them a pen and watched imploringly while they finished it. Miss Susan seemed to have an unerring instinct for spotting laziness and effort, too. Contrary to the headmistress's instructions, Miss Susan did not let the children do what they liked. She let them do what she liked. It had turned out to be a lot more interesting for everyone. Miss Susan held up the cardboard clock and said, Who can tell me what this is? A forest of hands shot up. Yes. Miranda. It's a clock, Miss Miss Susan smiled, carefully avoided the hand that was being waved by a boy called Vincent, who was also making frantically keen oo 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 noises, and chose the one behind him. Nearly right, she said. Yes, Samuel. It's all cardboard made to look like a clock, said the boy. Correct. Always see what's really there. 
and I'm supposed to teach you to tell the time with this. Miss Susan gave it a sneer and tossed it away. Shall we try a different way, she said, and snapped her fingers. Yes, the class chorused, and then it went off, as the walls, floor and ceiling dropped away and the desks hovered high over the city. A few feet away was the huge cracked face of the tower clock of Unseen University. The children nudged one another excitedly. The fact that their boots were over 300 feet of fresh air didn't seem to bother them. Oddly, too, they did not seem surprised. This was just an interesting thing. They acted like connoisseurs who had seen other interesting things. You did, when you were in Miss Susan's class. Now, Melanie, said Miss Susan, as a pigeon landed on her desk. The big hand is on the twelve and the enormous hand is nearly on the ten, so it's... Vincent's hand shot up. Oh oh oh, miss, oh oh oh, oh oh oh. Nearly twelve o'clock, Melanie managed. Well done. But here. The air blurred. Now the desks, still in perfect formation, were firmly on the cobbles of a plaza in a different city. So was most of the classroom. There were the cupboards, and the nature table, and the blackboard. But the walls still lagged behind. No one in the plaza paid the visitors any attention but, oddly, no one tried to walk into them either. The air was warmer, and smelled of sea and swamp. Anyone know where this is, said Miss Susan. Oh oh oh, me, miss, oh oh oh. Oh oh oh. Vincent could only stretch his body taller if his feet left the ground. How about you, Penelope, said Miss Susan. Oh, miss, said a deflated Vincent. Penelope, who was beautiful, docile and frankly dim, looked around at the thronged square and the whitewashed, awning-hung buildings with an expression close to panic. We came here in geography last week said Miss Susan. City surrounded by swamps. On the View River. Famous cookery. Lots of seafood. Penelope's exquisite brow creased. The pigeon on Miss Susan's desk fluttered down and joined the pigeon flock prospecting for scraps among the flagstones, cooing gently to the others in Pigeon Pigeon. Aware that a lot could happen while people waited for Penelope to complete a thought process, Miss Susan waved at a clock on a shop across the square and said. And who can tell me the time here in Genua, please? Oh oh oh, miss, miss, oh oh oh. A boy called Gordon cautiously admitted that it might be three o'clock, to the audible disappointment of the inflatable Vincent. That's right, said Miss Susan. Can anyone tell me why it's three o'clock in Genua while it's twelve o'clock in Ankh-Morpork? There was no avoiding it this time. If Vincent's hand had gone up any faster it would have fried by air friction. Yes, Vincent. Oh 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 miss speed of light miss it goes at 600 miles an hour and at the moment the sun's rising on the rim near Genuous so 12 o'clock takes 3 hours to get to us miss. Miss Susan sighed. Very good, Vincent, she said, and stood up. Every eye in the room watched her as she crossed over to the stationary cupboard. It seemed to have traveled with them and now, if there had been anyone to note such things, they might have seen faint lines in the air that denoted walls and windows and doors. And if they were intelligent observers, they'd have said. So. This classroom is in some way still in Ankh-Morpork and also in Genua, is it? Is this a trick? Is this real? Is it imagination? Or is it that, to this particular teacher, there is not much of a difference? The inside of the cupboard was also present, and it was in that shadowy, paper-smelling recess that she kept the stars. There were gold stars and silver stars. One gold star was worth three silver ones. The headmistress disapproved of these, as well. She said they encouraged competitiveness. Miss Susan said that was the point, 
and the headmistress scuttled away before she got a look. Silver stars weren't awarded frequently and gold stars happened less than once a fortnight, and were vied for accordingly. Right now Miss Susan selected a silver star. Pretty soon Vincent the Keen would have a galaxy of his very own. To give him his due, he was quite uninterested in which kind of star he got. Quantity, that was what he liked. Miss Susan had privately marked him down as boy most likely to be killed one day by his wife. She walked back to her desk and laid the star, tantalizingly, in front of her. And an extra special question, she said, with a hint of malice. Does that mean it's then there when it's now here? The hand slowed halfway in its rise. Oh oh oh. Vincent began, and then stopped. Doesn't make sense, miss. Questions don't have to make sense, Vincent, said Miss Susan. But answers do. There was a kind of sigh from Penelope. To Miss Susan's surprise the face that one day would surely cause her father to have to hire bodyguards was emerging from its normal happy daydream and wrapping itself around an answer. Her alabaster hand was rising, too. The class watched expectantly. Yes, Penelope. It's. Yes. It's always now everywhere, miss. Exactly right. Well done. All right, Vincent, you can have the silver star. And for you, Penelope. Miss Susan went back to the cupboard of stars. Getting Penelope to step off her cloud long enough even to answer a question was worth a star but a deep philosophical statement like that had to make it a gold one. I want you all to open your notebooks and write down what Penelope just told us, she said brightly as she sat down. And then she saw the inkwell on her desk beginning to rise like Penelope's hand. It was a ceramic pot, made to drop neatly into a round hole in the woodwork. It came up smoothly, and turned out to be balanced on the cheerful skull of the death of rats. It winked one blue glowing eye socket at Miss Susan. With quick little movements, not even looking down, she whisked the inkwell aside with one hand and reached for a thick volume of stories with the other. She brought it down so hard on the hole that blue-black ink splashed onto the cobbles. Then she raised the desk lid and peeped inside. There was, of course, nothing there. At least, nothing macabre. Unless you counted the piece of chocolate half gnawed by rat teeth and a note in heavy gothic lettering saying, See me and signed by a very familiar alpha and omega symbol and the word Grandfather Susan picked up the note and screwed it into a ball, aware that she was trembling with rage. How dare he! And to send the rat, too. She tossed the ball into the waste paper basket. She never missed. Sometimes the basket moved in order to ensure that this was the case. And now we'll go and see what the time is in Clatch, she told the watching children. On the desk, the book had fallen open at a certain page. And, later on, it would be story time. And Miss Susan would wonder, too late, why the book had been on her desk when she had never even seen it before and a splash of blue-black ink would stay on the cobbles of the square in Genua, until the evening rainstorm washed it away. Tick the first words that are read by seekers of enlightenment in the secret, gong-banging, yeti haunted valleys near the hub of the world, are when they look into the life of when the eternally surprised. The first question they ask is, Why was he eternally surprised? And they are told, when considered the nature of time and understood that the universe is, instant by instant, recreated anew. Therefore, he understood, there is in truth no past, only a memory of the past. Blink your eyes, and the world you see next did not exist when you closed them. Therefore, he said, the only appropriate state of the mind is surprise. The only appropriate state of the heart is joy. The sky you see now, you have never seen before. The perfect moment is now. Be glad of it. 
the first words read by the young Eliudza when he sought perplexity in the dark, teeming, rain-soaked city of Ankh-Morpork were. Rooms for rent, very reasonable. And he was glad of it. Tick where there is suitable country for grain, people farm. They know the taste of good soil. They grow grain. Where there is good steel country, furnaces turn the sky to sunset red all night. The hammers never stop. People make steel. There is coal country, and beef country, and grass country. The world is full of countries where one thing shapes the land and the people. And up here in the high valleys around the hub of the world, where the snow is never far away, this is enlightenment country. Here are people who know that there is no steel, only the idea of steel. 5. They give names to new things, and to things that don't exist. They seek the essence of being and the nature of the soul. They make wisdom. Temples command every glacier-headed valley, where there are particles of ice in the wind, even at the height of summer. There are the listening monks, seeking to discern within the hubbub of the world the faint echoes of the sounds that set the universe in motion. There are the Brothers of Cool, a reserved and secretive sect which believes that only through ultimate coolness can the universe be comprehended, and that black works with everything, and that chrome will never truly go out of style. In their vertiginous temple criss-crossed with tightropes, the balancing monks test the tension of the world and then set out on long, perilous journeys to restore its equilibrium. Their work may be seen on high mountains and isolated islets. They use small brass weights, none of them bigger than a fist. They work. Well, obviously they work. The world has not tipped up yet. And in the highest, greenest, airiest valley of all, where apricots are grown and the streams have floating ice in them even on the hottest day, is the monastery of Oidong and the fighting monks of the Order of Wen. The other sects call them the history monks. Not much is known about what they do, although some have remarked on the strange fact that it is always a wonderful spring day in the little valley and that the cherry trees are always in bloom. The rumor is that the monks have some kind of duty to see that tomorrow happens according to some mystic plan devised by some man who kept on being surprised. In fact, for some time now, and it would be impossible and ridiculous to say how long, the truth has been stranger and more dangerous. The job of the history monks is to see that tomorrow happens at all. The master of novices met with Rinpo, chief acolyte to the abbot. At the moment, at least, the position of chief acolyte was a very important post. In his current condition the abbot needed many things done for him, and his attention span was low. In circumstances like this, there is always someone willing to carry the load. There are Rinpo's everywhere. It's Lud again, said the master of novices. Oh, dear. Surely one naughty child can't trouble you. One ordinary naughty child, no. Where is this one from? Master Soto sent him. You know? Of our Ankh-Morpork section? He found him in the city. The boy has a natural talent, I understand, said Rinpo. The master of novices looked shocked. Talent. He is a wicked thief. He'd been apprenticed to the Guild of Thieves, he said. Well. Children sometimes steal. Beat them a little, and they stop stealing. Basic education, said Rinpo. Ah. There is a problem. Yes. He is very, very fast. Around him, things go missing. Little things. Unimportant things. But even when he is watched closely, he is never seen to take them. Then perhaps he does not. He walks through a room and things vanish, said the master of novices. He's that fast. It's just as well Soto did find him, then. But a thief is they turn up later, in odd places said the master of novices, apparently grudging the admission. 
he does it out of mischief, I'm sure. The breeze blew the scent of cherry blossom across the terrace. Look, I am used to disobedience, said the master of novices. That is part of a novice's life. But he is also tardy. Tardy. He turns up late for his lessons. How can a pupil be tardy here? Mr. Ludd doesn't seem to care. Mr. Ludd seems to think he can do as he pleases. He is also. Smart. The acolyte nodded. Ah. Uh, smart. The word had a very specific meaning here in the valley. A smart boy thought he knew more than his tutors, and answered back, and interrupted. A smart boy was worse than a stupid one. He does not accept discipline, said the acolyte. Yesterday, when I was taking the class for temporal theory in the stone room, I caught him just staring at the wall. Clearly not paying attention. But when I called out to him to answer the problem I'd chalked on the blackboard, knowing full well that he could not, he did so. Instantly. And correctly. Well. You did say he was a smart boy. The master of novices looked embarrassed. Except. It was not the right problem. I had been instructing the fifth gym field agents earlier and had left part of the test on the board. An extremely complex phase space problem involving residual harmonics in N histories. None of them got it right. To be honest, even I had to look up the answer. So I take it you punished him for not answering the right question. Obviously. But that sort of behavior is disruptive. Most of the time I think he's not all there. He never pays attention, he always knows the answers, and he can never tell you how he knows. We can't keep thrashing him. He is a bad example to the other pupils. There's no educating a smart boy. The acolyte thoughtfully watched a flight of white doves circle the monastery roofs. We cannot send him away now, he said at last. Soto said he saw him perform the stance of the coyote. That's how he was found. Can you imagine that? He'd had no training at all. Can you imagine what would happen if someone with that kind of skill ran around loose? Thank goodness Soto was alert. But he has turned him into my problem. The boy disrupts tranquility. Rinpo sighed. The master of novices was a good and conscientious man, he knew, but it had been a long time since he'd been out in the world. People like Soto spent every day in the world of time. They learned flexibility, because if you were stiff out there you were dead. People like Soto. Now, there was an idea. He looked towards the other end of the terrace, where a couple of servants were sweeping up the fallen cherry blossom. I see a harmonious solution, he said. Oh, yes. An unusually talented boy like Ludd needs a master, not the discipline of the schoolroom. Possibly, but the master of novices followed Rinpo's gaze. Oh, he said, and he smiled in a way that was not entirely nice. It contained a certain anticipatory element, a hint that trouble might be in store for someone who, in his opinion, richly deserved it. A name occurs, said Rinpo. To me also, said the master of novices. A name I've heard too often, Rinpo went on. I suppose that either he will break the boy, or the boy will break him, or it is always possible that they will break each other. The master mused. So, in the patois of the world, said Rinpo, there is no actual downside. Would the abbot approve, though, said the master, testing a welcome idea for any weak points. He has always had a certain rather tiresome regard for the sweeper. The abbot is a dear kind man but at the moment his teeth are giving him trouble and he is not walking at all well, said Rinpo. And these are difficult times. I'm sure he will be pleased to accept our joint recommendation. Why, it's practically a minor matter of day-to-day -day affairs. 
and thus the future was decided. They were not bad men. They had worked hard on behalf of the valley for hundreds of years. But it is possible, after a while, to develop certain dangerous habits of thought. One is that, while all important enterprises need careful organization, it is the organization that needs organizing, rather than the enterprise. And another is that tranquility is always a good thing. Tick there was a row of alarm clocks on the table by Jeremy's bed. He did not need them, because he woke up when he wanted to. They were there for testing. He set them for seven, and woke up at 6.59 to check that they went off on time. Tonight he went to bed early, with a drink of water and the grim fairy tales. He had never been interested in stories, at any age, and had never quite understood the basic concept. He'd never read a work of fiction all the way through. He did remember, as a small boy, being really annoyed at the depiction of Hickory Dickory Dock in a rag book of nursery rhymes, because the clock in the drawing was completely wrong for the period. He tried to read grim fairy tales. They had titles like How the Wicked Queen Danced in Red Hot Shoes, and The Old Lady in the Oven. There was simply no mention of clocks of any sort in any of them. Their authors seemed to have a thing about not mentioning clocks. The glass clock of Bad Shoeshine, on the other hand, did have a clock. Of a sort. And it was. Odd. A wicked man. Readers could see he was wicked because it said he was wicked, right there on the page. Built a clock of glass in which he captured time herself, but things went wrong because there was one part of the clock, a spring, that he couldn't make out of glass, and it broke under the strain. Time was set free and the man aged 10,000 years in a second and crumbled to dust and. Not surprisingly, in Jeremy's opinion. Was never seen again. The story ended with a moral. Large enterprises depend upon small details. Jeremy couldn't see why it couldn't just as well have been it's wrong to trap non-existent women in clocks, or, it would have worked with a glass spring. But even to Jeremy's inexperienced eye, there was something wrong with the whole story. It read as though the writer was trying to make sense of something he'd seen, or been told, and had misunderstood. And. Ha. Huh. Although it was set hundreds of years ago when even in Uberwald there were only natural cuckoo clocks, the artist had drawn a long case clock of the sort that wasn't around even 15 years ago. The stupidity of some people. You'd laugh if it wasn't so tragic. He put the book aside and spent the rest of the evening doing a little design work for the guild. They paid him handsomely for this, provided he promised never to turn up in person. Then he put the work on the bedside table by the clocks. He blew out the candle. He went to sleep. He dreamed. The glass clock ticked. It stood in the middle of the workshop's wooden floor, giving off a silvery light. Jeremy walked around it, or perhaps it spun gently around him. It was taller than a man. Within the transparent case red and blue lights twinkled like stars. The air smelled of acid. Now his point of view dived into the thing, the crystalline thing, plunging down through the layers of glass and quartz. They rose past him, their smoothness becoming walls hundreds of miles high and still he fell between slabs that were becoming rough, grainy, full of holes. The blue and red light was here too, pouring past him. And only now was there sound. It came from the darkness ahead, a slow beat that was ridiculously familiar, a heartbeat magnified a million times. Chum, chum. Each beat slower than mountains and bigger than worlds, dark and blood red. He heard a few more and then his fall slowed, stopped, and he began to soar back up through the sleeting light until a brightness ahead became a room. He had to remember all this. It was all so clear, once you saw it. So simple. So easy. He could see every part, how they interlocked, 
how they were made. And now it began to fade. Of course it was only a dream. He told himself that and was comforted by it. But he had gone to some lengths with this one, he had to admit. For example, there was a mug of tea steaming on the nearby workbench, and the sound of voices on the other side of the door. There was a knocking at the door. Jeremy wondered if the dream would end when the door was opened, and then the door disappeared and the knocking went on. It was coming from downstairs. The time was 6.47. Jeremy glanced at the alarm clocks to make sure they were right, then pulled his dressing gown around him and hurried downstairs. He opened the front door a crack. There was no one there. Nah, Don Air, Mr. Someone lower down was a dwarf. Name of clock son, it said. Yes. A clipboard was thrust through the gap. Sign air, where it says sign air. Thank you. Okay, lads. Behind him, a couple of trolls tipped up a handcart. A large wooden crate crashed onto the cobbles. What is this, said Jeremy. Express package, said the dwarf, taking the clipboard. Come all the way from Uberwald. Must have cost someone a packet. Look at all them seals and stickers on it. Can't you bring it in? Jeremy began, but the cart was already moving off, with the merry jingle and tinkle of fragile items. It started to rain. Jeremy peered at the label on the crate. It was certainly addressed to him, in a neat round hand, and just above it was the seal with the double-headed bat of Uberwald. There was no other marking except, near the bottom, the words. This side up, this text upside down then the crate started to swear. It was muffled, and in a foreign language, but all swearing has a certain international content. E.R. Hello, said Jeremy. The crate rocked, and landed on one of the long sides, with extra cursing. There was some thumping from inside, some louder swearing, and the crate teetered upright again with the alleged top the right way up. A piece of board slid aside and a crowbar dropped out and onto the street with a clang. The voice that had lately been swearing said, If you would be though good. Jeremy inserted the bar into a likely looking crack, and pulled. The crate sprang apart. He dropped the bar. There was a... A creature inside. I don't know, it said, pulling bits of packing material off itself. Ate bloody date with no problem, and thought idiot get it wrong on the Dorth Tep. It nodded at Jeremy. Good morning, Thursday. I thought you are Mr. Jeremy. Yes, but my name is Igor. Thursday. My credentials, Thursday a hand like an industrial accident held together with stitches thrust a sheaf of papers towards Jeremy. He recoiled instinctively, and then felt embarrassed and took them. I think there has been a mistake, he said. No, no mistake, said Igor, pulling a carpet bag out of the ruins of the crate. You need an a fifth tent. And when it cometh to a fifth tenth, you cannot go wrong with an Igor. Everyone knows that. Could we go in out of the rain, Thursday? It makes my knee roost. But I don't need an assist, Jeremy began, but that was wrong, wasn't it? He just couldn't keep assistance. They always left within a week. Morning, sir, said a cheery voice. Another cart had pulled up. This one was painted a gleaming, hygienic white and was full of milk churns, and had Ronald Soak, dairyman painted on the side. Distracted, Jeremy looked up at the beaming face of Mr. Soak, who was holding a bottle of milk in each hand. One pint, squire, as per usual. And perhaps another one if you've got company. E.R., E.R., E.R. Yes, thank you. And the yogurt is particularly fine this week, squire, said Mr. Soak encouragingly. 
ER, ER, I think not, Mr. Soak. Need any eggs, cream, butter, buttermilk or cheese? Not as such, Mr. Soak. Right you are, then, said Mr. Soak, unabashed. See you tomorrow, then. ER, yes, said Jeremy, as the cart moved on. Mr. Soak was a friend, which in Jeremy's limited social vocabulary meant someone I speak to once or twice a week. He approved of the milkman, because he was regular and punctual and had the bottles at the doorstep every morning on the stroke of 7 a.m. ER, ER. Goodbye, he said. He turned to Igor. How did you know I needed he tried. But the strange man had gone indoors, and a frantic Jeremy tracked him down in the workshop. Oh yes, very nith, said Igor, who was taking it all in with the air of a connoisseur. That the turnball MK3 microlathe, isn't it? I saw it in their catalogue. Very nith indeed I didn't ask anyone for an assistant, said Jeremy. Who sent you? We are Igorth, Thursday yes, you said. Look, I don't know, Thursday. We are Igorth, Thursday. The Organethation, Thursday what organization? For Plethmonth, Thursday. You the, Thursday, the thing is. An Igor often finds himself between Marthdur through no fault of his own, you the. And on the other hand you have two thumbs, breathed Jeremy, who had just noticed and couldn't stop himself. Two on each hand. Oh, yes Thursday, very handy, said Igor, not even glancing down. On the other hand there is no shortage of people wanting an Igor. Though my aunt Igorina runs our select little agency. 4. Lots of Igors, said Jeremy. Oh, there th a fair number of us. We're a big family. Igor handed Jeremy a card. He read. We are Igors a spare hand when needed the old rothouse bad shoeshine see mail. Yes Martha Uberwald Jeremy stared at the semaphore address. His normal ignorance of anything that wasn't to do with clocks did not apply here. He'd been quite interested in the new cross-continent semaphore system after hearing that it made quite a lot of use of clockwork mechanisms to speed up the message flow. So you could send a clax message to hire an Igor? Well, that explained the speed, at least. Rothouse, he said. That means something like a council hall, doesn't it? Normally, Thursday. Normally, said Igor reassuringly. Do you really have semaphore addresses in Uberwald? Oh, yes. We are ready to grasp the future with both hands, Thursday and four thumbs yes, Thursday. We can grasp like anything. And then you mailed yourself here. Thirteenly, Thursday. We Igorth are no strangers to discomfort. Jeremy looked down at the paperwork he'd been handed, and a name caught his eye. The top paper was signed. In a way, at least. There was a message in neat capitals, as neat as printing, and a name at the end. He will be useful Legine he remembered. Oh, Lady L.E. Jean is behind this. She had you sent to me. That th correct. Thursday feeling that Igor was expecting more of him, Jeremy made a show of reading through the rest of what turned out to be references. Audiobook generated by, Read with the Ears.